Today's episode is brought to you by the Pre-Market Movers. Check us out at thepremarketmovers.com. We are your number one source for everything Wall Street related, broadcasting to you live on social audio platforms worldwide. You can catch us on Clubhouse as well as Twitter Spaces, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays at 7.30 a.m. to 9 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Check us out online at thepremarketmovers.com. That's the premarketmovers.com. We're here on another episode of the Entrepreneur Kickback with Mr. Wesley Owens. I want to get into it. Um, for those who may not know you, can you give a brief description of yourself, sir? Sure. So um, Wesley Owens, um, Atlanta native, born and raised, extremely rare, especially nowadays, right? Atlanta's super transient. We jokingly say we're ATL born, ATL bred, and when we die, we'll be ATL dead. So <laughs> that's the uh, that's the joke in Atlanta. Anyway, um, went to... Uh, the illustrious Howard University from an undergraduate degree, wrapping up my MBA right now at Columbia with a concentration in entrepreneurial finance, venture capital, and private equity. And I'm a serial entrepreneur at heart. I had my first business when I was 26. I had my first million by the time I was 27 or so, so about a year or so later. And I jokingly say I've, I've made and lost more money than most people will ever see in their lifetime. And, um, you know, some, sometimes people take that as a bit of arrogance, but it's actually just the truth. I, as I said, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I've been in, been in the real estate space. I've been in the um, technology space, the finance space, and I'm, I made probably the most money in the staffing space. And that's the space that I'm currently in now. In the future, looking to fuse both staffing and finance, but we'll talk about that down the line. So I find myself now in the staffing space with, with a bit of a twist on it, as you said. So that's that's where I am now. So you triggered something because you said you've lost more money than most people have made in a lifetime. Absolutely. And this is just me from my critique from all the people, all the entrepreneurs I've been talking to. I've been gauging people based off how much money they lost as opposed to how much money they made. Early 2000, I was in the real estate space doing really well. I owned probably four apartment complexes at the time, um, a couple of strip centers, developed a strip center from the ground up you know, over in Stone Mountain, flipped some apartments, did some townhouses, you know, just a number of things, right? And, a, you know, a good number of single family homes. I absolutely had my feet firmly planted in the real estate space. And 2007 happened right? The real estate bubble burst. And there wasn't any real indicator for guys like me. We were flipping properties, you know, developing properties, managing properties, doing all this stuff with real estate. It was a great time. And one day we just couldn't refinance a house anymore. One day you just couldn't sell a property. Anymore. And I remember I was at the office waiting on a lender to call me back. They had to do what was called a drive-by appraisal. Right. So that's literally where the appraiser is in his car and literally drives by the property to visually verify that it's there. Doesn't require them to go in and require them to do a drawing of the property. Any of that stuff. It was a drive by appraisal. One day turned into two, turned into four, turned into five. And I was like, listen, like I know traffic in Atlanta is bad, but it's not taking this guy five days to go do a drive by appraisal. And I finally got the lender on the phone and said, you know, what's going on? And they basically said, we're filing bankruptcy and we're pulling out of Georgia as a lender. And basically real estate is over. See ya. Good luck. And I was like, you got to be kidding. And I literally flipped on the television and it was all over CNN. I didn't know the term leverage at the time. Right. I just knew <laughs> your face is hilarious. I, I didn't know what leverage was. I just knew that I was. I was highly, le I was highly mortgaged. I, I learned later that highly mortgaged meant you were highly leveraged. And, you know, man, I was holding about $15 million worth of property. 
And I literally lost it all. You know, I had a house on the lake, you know, for, for your listeners who are in Georgia and Stone Mountain, they know Water's Edge. Um, I had a house on the lake in Water's Edge, right? Doing well, right? Lost my house on the lake, had my, had a seven series BMW with my clothes in the back of it. By the way, my seven series was paid for, right? Thankfully, I had my clothes in the back of it. And again, like I said, I literally had to start over. So when, when people talk about making money and losing money and all those kinds of things, I love your gauge because if you pay attention to social media and you pay attention to what people say, everybody's winning, right? And I hate the, the, the psychology of that. And I hate what that does to entrepreneurs who are, you know, just starting out because it makes you feel less than it makes you question yourself. It makes you question your journey. It makes you question all of that because at the end of the day, you're like, well, wait a minute. Maybe I'm, I'm not as smart as I think I am because everybody's winning. And why am I not winning? Right. I tell people all the time, real estate was the hardest thing I ever did because it wasn't my desire. Right. I ended up there through, you know, it's a turn of events, but real estate was the family business. It wasn't my business. And, you know, I was in technology at the time and, um, you know, I kind of had to, had to go help out in the family business. I just, it was, you know, the learning curve was steep, right? It was, it was, you know, back then there really wasn't a YouTube back then you were still, we were still on Yahoo. So Google didn't really exist. You know, there weren't people doing master classes. There weren't all the resources that we have at our disposal today, 25 years ago, just didn't really exist. You know, there was no such thing as Facebook. So you didn't get on Facebook and say, hey, I got this house. Who wants it? And you've got a friend list of 5,000 people who could then share it out to their friends list. And, you know, 48 hours later, this house is gone. That's not how it, that's not how it happened, right? We had you know, email lists for real, where you would just put everybody's name in an email and then you'd send it out. And if Yahoo shut you down, they just shut you down. So things were just a little different back then. Listen, when entrepreneurs talk, I listen for the sum of your experience. And if you tell me you've only ever won, then either you're being disingenuous or you just haven't, you haven't hit the levels that you claim to have hit yet. I think that's going to be my question from now on, you know, how much you lost. You know, when I first came up with the concept of this show and I was talking to two gentlemen, which they're going to be on future episodes, they talked about how much they lost. And the way I the way I process that. If you can handle losing a million dollars, you can handle a lot. You can you can handle a whole lot. I mean, as far as finances. And in your personal life. And for these people that I noticed who've lost, you know, what some people may say a tremendous amount of money, they have this resolve. And they're very calm. They have this paint a picture on everybody. Just just what I noticed. Like even yourself, you have this cadence about you. You know, you you chill, you cool, intelligent, calculated, I'm assuming. And I think that's an invaluable trait. Sure. And I'm going to tell you where that comes from, right? When you're, when you're young, you're full of energy, you're full of vigor, right? I used to hear people say all the time, life will humble you. You're turning deals, you're turning and burning. I used to, you know, I don't know how much you know about the real estate space, but the first Tuesday of every month in the investment world is important. It's important because the first Tuesday of every month is foreclosure Tuesday. So that's the, that's the Tuesday morning that the lenders gather on whatever, you know, the local courthouse steps and they start to auction off properties because people haven't paid their mortgage, right? As an investor, I used to, I, you know, I would jokingly say I'm lapping 285, but I would be lapping 285 on Monday night trying to help people save their mortgages before they, or trying to help people save their houses before they went to the courthouse steps on Tuesday, right? I probably have done five, seven houses on a Monday night, right? I'm at everybody's law office in the middle of the night, sliding cashier's checks under doors, right? All kinds of stuff. When you're young, you have that kind of energy. 
when you're able to help people stop their, you know, stop their foreclosures, you build your portfolio in the process. It's a great feeling, right? You know, you're building assets, your balance sheet looks good, cash flowing, things are fine. Things are great, right? Pretty much buy anything you want to, take the trips you want to, you know, it's all lifestyle. It's all the stuff that people talk about on the internet, right? None of that's new. We've been doing that for 25 years. But when you lose it all, right? When you have all your stuff in the trunk of your car and all of that stuff, right? When you start calling people and they stop taking your calls and and they're acting like somehow the crash, the real estate crash was your fault and all that kind of stuff, it humbles you. And it shows you who your friends are. It teaches you how to move differently. You take a little bit of what they call the rah, rah, rah. You take the rah, rah, rah out your voice, right? I, listen, I'm the quietest person in the room now. You know, we'll move on through the story, but I will tell you, when I built my first staffing company, um, that company, so you heard me say I had $15 million worth of real estate, lost it all. Um, my staffing company was doing um, you know, it was doing well. And that's usually what I would say to people. I would just say, oh, we're doing well. We were doing over $50 million a year in, re in revenue. Did damn well, right? The biggest compliment people paid me after the fact was they said, we never knew you were doing that well. Yeah, because I never said it out loud. And I never acted like it because I'd already been humbled once before, right? And And that's the thing. I said it before, I'll say it again. I've seen, I've started companies that have done big revenue numbers. I've seen big revenue numbers. I've lost big revenue numbers, right? Most, like I said, most people can't get on here and tell you they had a company doing 50, 60, $100 million in revenue. And I think our ultimate number was $120 million in revenue. That's more than most people will ever see in a lifetime. Just is, right? You know, one of the things you asked me, and certainly we'll get into it later on or throughout the, the course of the conversation. But you asked me, how do people even get started down that path? I'm happy to share. There's plenty. Listen, there's so much more money out there than what we were doing. It's just how we did it and how we were able to, to really put it together. And unless someone explains it to you, which I'm happy to do in this, in this interview, you're just not going to understand how to do it. Not at that level anyway. But we'll move on. We'll move on from that and we'll talk about other things. We can get into it. Hold on. Because after you said you lost 15 million, I had to cut my video on because I felt my face <laughs> change. Like, <laughs> OK, <laughs> how did you rebound from that? How do you rebound from that? So honestly, I um, I bumped around for a couple of years. One thing I'll say to you and your listeners, when you have a failed business, it's like, you know, it's like having a death in the family, right? It's like losing a family. As entrepreneurs, we get really invested, not just financially, but emotionally in our ventures, right? Erica Badu said it better than anybody else. She said, I'm an artist, so I'm sensitive about my, <laughs> right? Mm. It's exactly the same way with a business owner. You're sensitive about what it is you're doing. You're passionate about it, right? Especially if you're a full-time entrepreneur, right? If you're a full-time if you're full time, that's what you do. That's how you that's how you butter your bread. That's how you feed your family. That's how you keep a roof over your head. So the seriousness and the dedication is next level for most entrepreneurs. Right. And so if for any reason it doesn't work, most people who have a nine to five who have a paycheck every Friday or every two weeks kind of shake it off and be like, oh, man, you know, whatever. Come on, you, you know, just pull yourself together and do the next thing. It's not that easy especially when you're emotionally invested, especially when you have big numbers and you have, you know, you have, you just, you get used to things, right? So it did. It took me a couple of years of just kind of getting it together, trying to shake it off. I finally, I did what I said I wasn't going to do. And, you know, I'm going to encourage your listeners to, to hear this part if you don't hear anything else. I got a job, but I didn't just get any job. I was strategic about what I did. I remember that I was sitting around thinking one day and I said, you know, my, my child support payments were mounting up. Right. And if you know anything about child support, it's like, oh, in the mob, 
Like they're going to get theirs regardless, one way or the other. And I said, you know, I got to pay these child support payments. I've got to, I've got to be able to provide and put a roof over my head. Like I really was, when I say I was picking up the pieces, I was picking up pieces. I said, well, you know, I don't know that there is a a job that I can get that's going to allow me to pay child support, right? Because my child support was based on, my child support was based on my previous tax returns and my previous career and all that kind of stuff, right? Well, you know, real estate was great. So I got a $3,000 a month child support payment, but I'm living out the trunk of my car. Now, of course, people will say, all you had to do was go back and yeah, but attorneys cost money. And I'm living out the trunk of my car. It just, it sounds like all you got to do when you're in a certain mental space, all you got to do is probably not going to be the answer to, you know, 95% of what's going through your head. Right. And so I remember thinking to myself, I need something where people work for me, but I get the money. And I said, for the life of me, I just don't know what that's called. I really didn't. Right. Where do you, what kind of job is it that people work for you, but you get the money? And I eventually landed on, I think that's actually called staffing. And I remembered that I'd seen this lady's condo unit in, in Buckhead. And I had a client at the time who was looking for a condo. He wanted a, a high end, what I call an adult condo. And this lady had a condo in Buckhead. She was leasing. It was $800,000. She owned it free and clear. And I remember asking the question, I said, I'm sorry. Like, what do you do that you have an $800,000 condo that you paid for, right? And they said, oh, she owns a staffing agency. I said, what is that? Like, I really didn't know what it was. They explained to me kind of what it was on the surface. I said, oh, okay, makes sense. And so I just reflected back on that conversation. I said, I got to figure out what the staffing thing is. Because surely if this lady can buy $800,000 condo cash, there must be great money in staffing. And so... That's literally that thought process that just kind of put me on the path. And then from there, I just started, you know, I started looking on at the time it was Monster and Career Builder. Indeed didn't exist. I started looking on Monster and Career Builder, trying to figure out, you know, what's it take to get a job in staffing? I just need an intro job just so I could get in and understand what was going on. And literally I got it. My first job was a work from home job. I worked there a month and I never got a check. And I was like, this is ridiculous. What I did get was experience. I got enough experience as a recruiter in that month to be savvy enough to land a, an interview as a recruiter at another company. And when I landed the interview, they gave me some job recs and I gave them back. And the lady said, what are you doing? I said, I don't want to work here. She said, what do you mean? I said, the, I, I recognize the job recs. I recognize the company that the job recs belong to. And I said, if that's, if that's your client, I just don't, I'll go find something else. And she said, well, what do you know about it? I, I gave her basically my 30 days of experience. And I said, listen, I said, I, I've done this. I said, it's too hard. This, these are the issues. And she said, Oh, wait, like you might be more advanced than most people we have here. And I was like, how is that possible? Like, you know, she said, give us a second. I said, okay. They went back, they got different job recs. They brought them back. I looked at those and I said, oh, what you're looking for is this, 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 and this. It turned out the job recs they went and got were IT job recs. And of course, that was my, that was my first career, right? So I I knew it cold. And they said, listen, they said, "Uh, if you want a job here, you can have one. I was like, great, I want one. And that's how I got into the staffing space and learned the, the staffing business. And as they say, the rest was history. In, in elementary terms, can you like explain like what a staffing agency does? We're in Atlanta, so I'll give you a couple of hometown companies, right? Um, UPS, Coca-Cola, and Delta. Most people assume that if you work at one of those three corporations, you actually work for UPS, Coca-Cola, or Delta. The truth is, 50% of the people who work at UPS, Coca-Cola, and Delta actually work there. Right. They actually work for the company. The other 50 percent of those people work for staffing agencies that were similar to the one that I owned. And they work for the staffing agency, but they work at the company. So when 
they get their check. Their check has whatever the staffing agency's name is. It doesn't have, you know, Coca-Cola, UPS, or Delta on it, but they go to work at Coca-Cola, UPS, and Delta on a daily basis. Now, what happens is Coca-Cola, UPS, and Delta will put out job recs and, you know, they will hire small staffing agencies like the one I, the one I owned. And they'll say, listen, we're looking for these people. Well, as a, as a candidate, you're on, you know, let's say Indeed, you're applying for these jobs. Well, you're applying for jobs at those staffing agencies, but those, those jobs that you're applying for at the staffing agency, you're really going to end up working at Coca-Cola, UPS, or Delta. A lot of times you hear them say they're, they're temp jobs or they're temp to perm. The, the term that we prefer to use in the, in the industry is that you're a contractor. You're contracting for, you know, three months, six months, nine months, or 12 months. And those jobs are as solid as a regular full-time, you know, a regular FTE, right? The difference is as an FTE, you're going to get corporate benefits. And oftentimes when you are a contractor at a staffing agency, either you get um, the staffing agency's benefits, which oftentimes, you know, the medical, dental, and vision, well, the medical is a little higher. Dental and vision are usually about the same. You know, the staffing agencies are going to offer long-term, short-term benefits, cancer coverage. They're going to offer all of that stuff. The major difference, you know, 401ks, they'll offer all that. The major difference is oftentimes just in the medical coverage because, of course, as a smaller staffing agency, we're just not going to get the we're not going to get the rates that a larger corporation will get. But otherwise, working at a staffing agency, you know, if you work at UPS, Coca-Cola, or Delta, but you work there through a staffing agency, you're getting, you know, it's it's just as, it's just as good. The only difference is, like I said, you just don't work directly for the corporation. Now, oftentimes, as a part of our contract, the company has the right at any time to convert you to an FTE. They'll pay us a fee for that finder's fee. We'll consider that that piece of business closed. Um, they convert the person from contractor to FTE and we, you know, they give us the role to fill again. So it works. It works out for both sides. Okay. So you're, you're in the business of helping businesses find good people for their companies. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Let's tap into that. Okay. I, I know you're, I'm, I'm starting to use this term. You're a peacock. Got a lot going. You got a lot of layers, but let's, let's stick to this. Uh, let's stick to the staffing. Like how was, how, how could one start to get into staffing? Cause it sounds like if you're a person who can connect with a lot of people and you understand a uh, industry, this may be an opportunity for, for someone. Absolutely. Um, I'll, I'll say this. Staffing is a great opportunity if you're a people person and you have a business background or a business mind, right? Um, before before understanding business, you have to understand people. But as soon as you understand people and you understand what motivates people, and oftentimes it's not money, right? People always think it's money. It's not. Sometimes people are motivated by flexibility, right? You know, we can certainly talk about what I call the pandemic pivot. We'll talk about that later, the great resignation. People are motivated by freedom, flexibility. Money's up there, but freedom and flexibility first, right? We're all getting to a point where we're stressed out, right? And so work-life balance is important to a lot of people. I've given you two or three things and I haven't said money yet, right? Money's probably number four on a lot of people's lists. Sometimes it's number five. But if you're a person who understands people, you understand business and you understand and, you, and you've had a, a, a corporate experience or you've had corporate exposure, then staffing might actually be a great career choice. As things continue to kind of progress and evolve, companies are shifting away from FTEs and they're absolutely shifting toward the contractor, right? If you look on indeed.com and just say, you know, contract positions in Atlanta and, you know, pick an industry, IT, customer service even, right? Call center. Everything is a contract position now. Companies are very, very, very selective about bringing, bringing someone in in a FTE position. And typically, people that they hire as FTEs are highly specialized. You see project managers maybe starting off in contractor roles. Eventually, they get converted to FTEs. But you see a lot of C-suite, you know, those are FTEs. 
because those are those jobs are typically what are called headhunted, right? So those are retained search. That's a little bit different, but majority of the majority of roles in, in corporations are contract positions. Um, you know, we've staffed everything from executive assistants, mailroom, cafeteria, cashiers, security, IT roles, accounting roles, accounts payables, receivable roles, um, finance guys, you know, a, a little bit of everything, salespeople, marketing people, a little bit of everything. But a lot of it is at this point, drivers, a lot of it is contract at this point. If someone was going to do that, they say, hey, listen, I really am interested in the staffing space. Here, here are a few things I would say, right? Here's, here's kind of a how to. First thing I would do is I would seek out what's called SHRM, the Society of HR Managers. Find a SHRM chapter in your local city and join that chapter. Staffing ultimately, or as they like to re refer to it in the corporate space, it's HR outsourcing. Um, it's an HR function. So you're, you're going to need to meet people in the HR space. That's how you start to figure out where the opportunities are. For those of you in the audience, or in your listening audience who are minorities, either white women, black women, or black men, or Asian women, Asian men, there are certifying bodies that will help you certify your business as a minority owned firm, right? You can either become a certified woman-owned business or you become a minority business enterprise at MBE. Once you get that certification, that certification is akin to the keys to unlock Fortune 500 doors, right? Does it guarantee you a contract? So let me be clear about that. But what it does is it guarantees you a conversation, guarantees you opportunities to have conversations. Now, what you do with those conversations is entirely up to you. People talk a lot about government contracting. There are certain requirements around government contracting. The federal government's absolutely your best customer ever in life ever. However, you're going to have to have certain certifications before you can effectively get a government contract. Now, once you get one government contract and you understand it, then you can certainly get in line to get as many as you want. But it's getting that first one and understanding how to do that. So once you, you know, I, I tell everyone, if you're interested in the space, first you have to be in, in the right environment, which is SHRM, and you have to have the right tools, which are the certifications. Once you're in the right environment, you've got the right tools and you start having the right conversations, there really is, there's no ceiling to that opportunity. Okay, you said SHRM and then get your certifications if you meet that particular requirement. Where where would you go to get those minority or women certifications? There is a there are two national certifying bodies for a minority certification. You're going to look at the National Minority Supplier Development Council, NMSDC.org is their website. Um, they are based in New York. And from their website, they will point you to a local certifying body in you know, that's close to your major city that covers your city or state. Um, and then, for instance, in Georgia, we have, you know, the, the GMSDC, right? The Georgia Minority Supplier Development Council. But GMSDC handles the entire state of Georgia, right? Whereas um, if you are in, let's say, for instance, North Carolina, you have what's called the Carolina Virginia Council, which is, you know, that council handles Virginia, North Carolina, and South Carolina. So in that case, they handle three states. So again, just reach out to the NMSDC. NMSDC.org is their, is their website. And then from there, you can, uh, you can figure out which council handles your city or state based on um, their coverage map. Um, and then it's the same thing for uh, WeBank, Women's Business Enterprise Network, uh, Women's Business Enterprise Council, I'm sorry. Um, however, the Women's Business Enterprise Council, um, different website, but it's the exact same concept. You'll reach out to their website, figure out which council handles your city or state, and then it'll they'll give you the contact information and the website for your local council. 
follow those links, you'll be able to initiate your uh, certification application. It takes about 90 days um, after you submit it for it to come back you know, with completion. And uh, from there, you're certified and you can begin to, um, you know, you can begin pursuit of step, the staffing space uh, with Fortune 500 companies. Okay. So I'm, I'm assuming you may need a few things before you even apply. Probably need your entity, your EIN number. Birth certificate, EIN number. There's a laundry list of, app, of, of items you need for the application. Um, you're, you'll need your corporate, your corporate docs, you know, checking account information, signature cards, birth certificate, copies of your driver's license, passport. You know, there, there are certain, certain documents you'll need just to prove your, not only your identity, but your ethnicity. And then obviously corporate documents will prove the ownership of your corporation. And then from there, um, you know, you can move right through. And um, like I said, they'll, they'll issue that certification and within 90 days after receiving your application completed and you're on to the next step. Next time on Entrepreneur Kickback. Most people, and I'll tell you what happens, right? Most people assume that because they are a minority or a person of color, through them just owning the business, it's automatically certified as minority, and that's not the case. Um, there's actually a certifying body, which most people don't realize. And these major corporations know that. They're looking for that certification. They need that piece of paper. But once you get that piece of paper, then, you know, the conversation is, is wide open, and it's, you know, how can we help you help us? I'd like to thank you guys for kicking back with us. If you want to connect with us on social media, you can follow us on TikTok, Instagram, and Facebook at The Entrepreneur Kickback, all one word. We also building out a YouTube channel. You can follow us on The Patent House on YouTube. You can also catch me on Twitter. If you want to hit me up on Twitter, I'm at Podcaster Patton on Twitter. I'm also on Clubhouse. If you want to hit me on Clubhouse, you can hit me at ppatton248 on Clubhouse. Also, if you want to check out our website, theentrepreneurkickback.com, right now you can listen to the show and it also connects you to all our social media and our links. And you can listen to us on the website and all podcasting platforms. I'd like to thank you guys. Peace.